Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Okay, welcome back to Nanoscale Transistors. So we've been talking for over four weeks now about devices, transistors. Transistors are useful because they enable circuits. Uh, and in order to design a device that has the appropriate characteristics that make it useful in circuit applications, we don't need to become proficient circuit designers, but we need to appreciate some basic considerations about what makes a device good for circuits. That's the focus of the last three lectures of this course. We're going to take a, a, a really very quick view, but try to hit some highlights on digital circuits and analog circuits. This lecture and the next one has to do with digital circuits, and then we'll do a quick look at analog circuits in the final lecture of the course. Now, we spent almost all of the course talking about N-channel MOSFETs. Electrons carried the current from the source to the drain. Uh, we mentioned that there's a complementary device called a P-channel MOSFET, where holes carry the current from the source to the drain. We're going to need both devices for circuits. So here's the IV characteristic for our NMOS that we're familiar with now. We have a series of curves, drain current versus drain to source voltage. As we step the gate voltage up, we get more and more current once we've turned the device on and uh, created an inversion layer. The top curve here is where the gate voltage is the maximum it can be, the power supply voltage, VDD. Now, we have a complementary device. We have a P-channel device that has a P-type source and a P-type drain. We apply a negative voltage to the drain to attract holes from the source. And we apply negative voltages to the, uh, between the gate and the source to lower the potential barrier for holes. So we get a series of curves that just look like the complement. All of the positive voltages were become negative voltages. We have to apply a gate voltage that's more negative than some critical voltage to turn the device on. The maximum current we get is when we apply the maximum negative voltage to the gate, which is minus the power supply voltage. So we're going to need both flavors of devices. Uh, this is a circuit schematic for an NMOS device. If it's a bulk device, then it's built on a substrate, and we have to worry about where we connect that substrate. So B is the body or the bulk of the material. And we apply a gate voltage bigger than the threshold voltage, and the threshold voltage is a positive number in this case. We apply a drain voltage that's positive, and we get these very familiar current voltage characteristics. Now the other device looks like this. We draw a circuit schematic that's similar. We have a little open circle here to remind us that this is a P-channel device. That's how we identify it. The dashed line there, just as it was for the, uh, the N-channel device, means it's an enhancement mode device. No channel exists until we apply the appropriate gate voltage. In this case, the threshold voltage is negative. We have to, we have to apply a gate to source voltage that's more negative than the negative threshold voltage to attract holes and produce an inversion layer channel of holes. We attach a positive, uh, negative voltage to the drain, so VDS is less than zero. That negative voltage attracts holes from the source and current flows. So all of the physics works the same. That's why we've just focused on N-channel devices. You can, if you can make this mental flip to holes, everything we've talked about that applies to N-channel also applies to P-channel. We just have to be careful about the signs. Okay, so now we can make a circuit. The basic circuit for CMOS analog and digital logic is the CMOS inverter. You can do circuit design with other types of circuits, but this is the basic starting point and the most commonly used circuit for, for uh, doing digital logic, and also you can build an analog amplifier from this. So in this particular case, we have a P-channel device and an N-channel device. Down here on the N-channel device, the drain is connected to the output, the source is grounded, and the input voltage is applied to the gate. Okay. We also have this body or bulk contact that we will ground as well. Okay. Now we have a P-channel device. The P-channel device is flipped upside down so that we get the right sign in voltages. So the drain is also connected to the output, but the source is connected to the most positive voltage. 
That means when the drain is less positive, we have a negative VDS, which is what we need for a P-channel. The input voltage is also connected to the gate of the P-channel as well. These two devices are in series and the output is taken from the connection between the two drains. All right, there is also a body contact to the P-channel. It's built on an N-type substrate. And again, we will connect the body contact and the source contacts to the same place. In this case, for the P-channel to the most positive voltage. That's our basic circuit. Now, if we plot the transfer characteristic of this circuit, that means the output voltage as a function of the input voltage, the ideal CMOS inverter will look like this. If we apply a low voltage on the input, we get a high output. If we apply a high voltage on the input, we get a low voltage output. And that's sort of easy to see. The low voltage doesn't turn on the NMOS, so that's open circuited. There's no connection to ground. But the low voltage, if this is voltage is, say, zero, then zero minus the source voltage of VDD is a very big negative voltage, large magnitude. It turns on the P-channel, so this output node is connected directly to VDD, and that's why we get a high voltage output. When the input voltage is high, say VDD, we turn on the end channel. Now we have a connection directly to ground, so the output voltage is zero. There is no voltage now between the gate and the source of the P-channel, so that's an open circuit and we're not connected the other way. That's the basic transfer characteristic of a CMOS inverter. If you take a cross-section of a CMOS process, you know, this is a few years old now, but the same considerations still apply. You know, this is what it looks like if we look at that CMOS inverter in cross-section. Here's the N-channel device, N-channel source, N-channel drain. Uh, here's our channel. It's built on a P-type substrate. So if we're doing this on a wafer, and then the wafer started out to be N-type, then we have to diffuse a P-type well into it. Here's our P-channel device. It has a P-type source, a P-type drain, and a P-type channel. It's built on an N-type substrate, or an N-type well now in the, in the wafer. You can see here the two drains are connected together. That's the output. You can see here that the source is connected to the body, over here the N-type body. Here you can see the source of the uh, N-channel is connected to the P-type body. Yeah. So you can map that circuit schematic onto this picture, and this is physically how the CMOS inverter works. Okay, so uh, if we look at this from the top, this is what it looks like. The N-type source and drains are these red regions. The black squares here are contacts that we make to make the ohmic contact to the source and the drain. The gate is this stripe that goes along. The width of that gate is the length of the, of the transistor. Here's our contact to the body over here. This is the P-channel device. So the green areas here are the P-type sources and drains. And the stripe down the middle is the gate for the P-channel device. The red area over here is the body contact to the N-type body that the P-channel device is built on. One of the things you'll notice is that the P-channel device is wider than the N-channel device. They have the same channel lengths, but they have different channel widths. Now that's traditionally what's done because the mobilities or the velocities of electrons and holes are much different. Generally, holes give less on-current P-channel devices give smaller on current than N-channel devices. So in order to match these two transistors that are in series, their two currents have to be equal. So we just make the P-channel device fatter than the N-channel, and then they have equal currents and the inverter is matched. Uh, this is beginning to change or has changed a little bit because strain silicon technology improves the PMOS more than it improves the NMOS. So the currents these days are a little closer to each other than they were from um, 10 years ago or so when this figure was taken. All right, so frequently um, designers will make the P-channel device twice as wide as the N-channel device. So uh, the last part of circuit design consists of actually laying out the structure of these transistors. So each process will have some kind of design rule, some kind of minimum tolerance or spacing between the contact and the gate, call that lambda. And then there will be a set 
the designer will be given a set of specifications. You, know, you can make your gate length twice that, that minimum lambda. Remember this lambda here is not now the mean free path, it has a different meaning. Um, the contact size is two lambda by two lambda. It has to be spaced at least a lambda from the gate electrode so we don't short it. And these are the kinds of rules that people use to lay out various types of CMOS circuits. And if we uh, scale our technology so that we can produce smaller features, we can still use these technology independent type of design rules. Now, how, do, how would you do digital logic? So we don't have time to go into this very deeply, but just to give you a sense as to how it's done. Digital logic is always made with pairs of P-channel and N-channel devices that are hooked up together. So you remember that an AND gate gives you a logical one output only when you have a logical one both at, the, at both of the two inputs. Now this circuit actually does a not AND. It gives us a logical zero output only when we have a logical one at both inputs. And to see how that works, let's just take one example from this truth table. A logical one, high voltage on input A, and a logical zero, low voltage on input B, and see what it produces for the output. So on input A, then we will uh, have a high voltage that turns on this NMOS, N-channel device, N1, the low voltage on input B keeps N2 turned off, so there's no connection from output C to ground. However, the high voltage on the input A, that means that there is no voltage between the gate and the source of the P-channel, so there's, that device is an open circuit. But the low voltage from input B means the voltage between the gate, zero volts, and the source, VDD, is a very big negative voltage, P2 is turned on and output 1 is connected to the high voltage, output C is connected to the high voltage, which is a logical one. So you can do more complex circuits, you can trace through all of the possible combinations and see how this all works. So the basic circuit that we want to, oper to understand is just this CMOS inverter. We've sketched its ideal transfer characteristics. In reality it's smoothed out a little bit and it, it looks like this. So, let's take a look at uh, a little bit about uh, the voltages that we have to apply to these circuits because we want to understand it in a little more detail. So, let's keep, keep this in mind for the next couple of slides. The input voltage in this particular case happens to be the gate to source voltage on the NMOS device. The output voltage happens to be the drain to source voltage in this particular circuit for the N-channel device. Now for the P-channel device, it's the input voltage minus VDD, which is the gate to source voltage. And the output voltage, or the uh, VDS for the uh, P-channel device, is the output voltage V out minus VDD, the source voltage. So we need to keep those, the VGS and VDS are what determines how the transistor operates, and we need to be sure we understand where they are in this circuit. So here are our transistor characteristics again. And if I start with a low input voltage, that means the gate to source voltage on the NMOS is low, and I'm operating down here where the device is cut off. At the same time, if I have a low input voltage, I have a very large negative VGS on the P-channel device, so I'm operating up here where the P-channel device is strongly turned on. If I have a high input voltage, I apply VDD to the input, then the gate to source voltage of the end channel is turned on and I'm operating up here strongly on. But if I have a high input voltage, then the, the uh, input voltage is VDD, the source voltage is VDD, so there's no voltage between the gate and the source of the PMOS and it's turned off. So we can trace through the various voltages and determine which operating region each of these transistors is operating in. We're interested in making a transition from input zero to one and understanding how that operates. So what's going to happen is that the input voltage, VGS, is going to increase for the NMOS. The magnitude of VGS is going to decrease for the PMOS as we make this transition. The output voltage then is going to go from high and it's going to make a transition to low 
And if we can understand how all of this operates, then we have a, we understand how the CMOS inverter operates. Okay, so the way to understand this is that the current, th the two drain currents have to be equal because these two devices are operating in series. So here's our IV characteristics. Remember, the uh, output voltage or VDS for the end channel was just the output voltage, but VDS for the uh, P channel device was the output voltage minus VDD, so I have to flip the P channel device around to plot it on the same characteristic. So if this is V out, it's VDS for the end channel, but it's I have to flip the P channel because VDS is V out minus uh, VDD. So we have a series of curves. The two currents have to be equal because the two transistors are in series. So wherever they intersect, that's a solution. And now we can just follow this through. We said when V in is equal to zero, that means we're cut off, so we're on the lower red line of the end channel, but the P channel is strongly on, so we're on the upper blue line of the P channel. Where those two intersect is our operating point, and that's right here with our high operating voltage. Now, if we increase the input voltage a little bit, now we turn the end channel device on, so we're operating on this first red curve here. We have a little bit less of a negative voltage between the, the P-channel gate and source, so we have less current, so we're operating on this blue line. The two intersect right there, and that's our operating point. And you could just continue the process. If we go up to four tenths of a volt, we're operating on the second red line and on the second, on the second blue line from the top. The two intersect right there. And we can map out this transition as the output voltage gets smaller and smaller. And one of the things you can observe is that once we go to some critical voltage, which is about half of the power supply voltage, we suddenly make a transition and the two curves intersect now at a very low voltage. So we've made a quick transition from a high output voltage to a low output voltage, and that's how our inverter works. So spend a little bit of time understanding how that all works, and then you'll understand what operating region each of these transistors uh, is working in. So, you know, for each of the points here, we can trace through. We saw the first point, the end channel device was off, the P channel device um, was operating in the, in the uh, very strong on region. Uh, as we continue to lower the uh, output voltage or increase the input voltage, we just continue to uh, move the operating points. Once we get right in the middle, we will have a big enough output voltage that will still keep the end channel device in the saturation region and will still big enough negative VDS for the P-channel device that will keep it in the saturated region. So in this transition region, both of the transistors are operating in the saturated region. But in the other two regions, one of them is always operating in the linear region, and one of them is always operating in the uh, saturation region. Okay, so that's the basic transfer characteristic for a CMOS inverter. And uh, one of the things that's interesting there is that if you look at any of the two regions with low voltage and high voltage, one of the two transistors is off. And since the devices are in series, that means no current is flowing. Current only flows in this region where we're switching between high and low. So if I plot the drain current, it's peaked right in the middle of this transfer characteristic. So that's called the crossover current and that happens while you're switching. That's a very nice feature of a CMOS inverter. If, you're, if it's sitting there with a one on its input, no current flows, we're not, it's not dissipating any power. If it's sitting there with a zero on its input, no current flows, no power is dissipated, except leakage power. And you only dissipate power when you're doing some switching. There's only dynamic power. So that's a very nice feature of this circuit. Now another very nice feature is something called noise margins. If you look at this transfer characteristic, it is you can see that there's a region where the slope suddenly gets very steep and you do the switching, but there's a region at the low end and a region at the high end where the, where the output is relatively insensitive to the input. Now that's very helpful because if our input voltage is not exactly zero, 
if it's just some small number, small voltage, it doesn't matter. The output voltage will be very high and will be close to or exactly a logical one. At the same point, when our input voltage is high, it might not be quite VDD because of noise or other variations or thing. It doesn't matter. The output voltage will be very low because of this particular shape of this transfer characteristic. So that's a very useful feature because when you hook a lot of transistors together in digital circuits, if the noise accumulates, you'll quickly lose the functionality of your circuit. But if each stage resets the output values to their appropriate values, insensitive to a little bit of noise on the input, then you can build large-scale circuits that operate. So these noise margins are very important. We have one on the low side and one on the high side, and if we design things properly, they're about symmetrical. But one of the things that you can see is that in order to get these noise margins, this transition here has to be very steep. Now that transition is the change in output voltage with respect to the change in input voltage. That's actually the voltage gain of this CMOS inverter. If we were operating this as an analog amplifier, that would be the amplification. So the slope in this case is negative because it's an inverter, and it's greater than 1. Now you can see that if the gain were 1, basically there was no gain or no amplification, then I would get this black dashed line. Now there are no regions at the low end or at the high end that are insensitive to the precise value of the input voltage. We've lost all noise margins. We will only get noise margins when we have gain. The device has to have a gain greater than one, then we'll have noise margins and we can do digital logic. So oftentimes you will see some new device being invented and it looks promising and interesting and very small and nanoscale and everything. And the first thing that someone who understands circuits will ask about this device is, does it have gain? If it has gain, we can do digital logic with it. Now, there are ways that you can reset noise without gain, but it gets very, very complicated. But gain is then very important for any device that we want to use for digital logic. Okay, so let's wrap up. We've tried to develop a basic understanding of this simple circuit, the CMOS inverter, our building block for digital logic. It consists of two transistors. The P-channel transistor is frequently called a pull-up transistor because when it's on, it pulls the output up to the power supply voltage. The N-channel transistor is frequently called a pull-down transistor because when it's turned on, it pulls down the output voltage to ground. Okay. This uh, circuit, it's very simple, but it has some very nice properties. There's very little current that flows unless you're actually switching, unless you're actually doing something useful. Now that's changed a little bit these days because there are leakage currents flowing. A few years ago, those leakage currents were so small we ignored them. But as devices get smaller and smaller, the off current that we've discussed gets larger and larger, and those leakage currents begin to add up and, and give us some power dissipation. So that's something that designers struggle with these days. It has good noise margins, this particular circuit, especially if we're using transistors that have some gain. So, We've understood its basic DC functionality. The, what I want to discuss in the next lecture is how we understand how fast we can operate this, how fast our microprocessor chip can work, and how much power is consumed when we're doing digital logic. So we'll talk about that in the next lecture.